Neville Symington said, you know, sometimes in the transference, um, when you're dealing with someone who's narcissistically, I don't know, defended, inclined, you don't, it's that you don't feel anything coming from them. Mm -hmm. That made me think about how it's sort of this process of exclusion or blocking. Is that something that happens to you? Absolutely. When I was getting supervision with Otto Kernberg, who emphasizes transference, I go to supervision, I say, Otto, I don't know what to do with this new patient. It's like I'm not there. There is no transference. And he said, well, that's the first stage of the narcissistic transference. The other doesn't exist. As critical as we might be of people with narcissism, they suffer a lot. I think they're kind of enslaved in an isolation. Because imagine you're in a room with your therapist and you hardly let the person in. You're just there kind of locked in your own self-contained system. It's a lonely world. Transference, as you said, is whatever the patient imagines you as. So the transfer is from the mind of the patient onto the outside world. Counter-transference, since we all have minds, is the feelings and images from the therapist that are provoked and experienced in relation to the patient. It gets a little bit complicated because there are two sources of counter-transference. We have to have our own therapy, usually, unless you're really, really good at self-awareness, to know ourselves well enough to figure out what part of my feelings towards this patient comes from me versus what part is provoked in me by the patient. Because patients, and people in general, have a way of interacting with us that elicit a feeling in us that is really theirs. Can I give you an example? Yeah, please. Okay. I was having a phone session. I was in my midtown office. It was sweltering. AC wasn't working well. While I'm listening to the patient, I quietly go over to the window and open it a couple of inches, and it made a little screeching sound like old windows do. So the patient said, what was that? So I said, oh, I'm open the, I opened the window, I'm sorry. And she said, I can't believe you did that. You know how sensitive I am. You know I have this startling reaction. You've ruined my day. I'm just gonna be miserable for the whole rest of the day. It's your fault. She slammed the phone down, and I was filled with a sense of being a monster. That was my counter-transference. I thought, I'm the lowest person on the face of the earth. I've ruined this woman's day. I'm mean, I'm bad, I create suffering. And it took me a few minutes to reorient myself to the external reality, which is, what happened? It was hot, I opened the window, that's reality, it makes a sound. People should kind of adjust themselves to reality. So from our point of view, a psychodynamic understanding is, she found a way in her interaction with me to transfer from me an internal part of herself, the sort of sadistic monster that she couldn't acknowledge in herself, although she could act it out all kinds of different ways. And she got me to be feeling like I was this horrible monster who barely deserved to live. And we use that awareness to better understand and empathize with the patient because I could calm myself down within a few minutes and say, you know, I'm really not a horrible monster, but she is dealing with that as a part of her internal world.